So uh, it starts with uh, five lines from the top. Vedabra Hashem El Moshe Lemor, thank you for the water, whoever brought it. Vedabra Hashem El Moshe Lemor. Aseilacha Shtecha Tzotzros Kesef. Make two trumpets out of silver. Miksha Taase Osam. Miksha, uh, the art school translates as uh, hammered out, which uh, is just one, another example of why the English translations come up short. Because hammered out means, miksha means that it's not only hammered out, it hammered out means it's hammered out of one piece. Miksha means you take one block, in this case it's silver, and you beat, you, you hammer out of this one block the item which is a trumpet. You do not take separate pieces and then connect them together. So the word miksha, which is obviously comes from the word kashe, which is hard, difficult, challenging, but it also means hard. I mean, miksha means hard, and it's used. We find it two other times in the Torah where there is miksha. Does anybody know where this shows menorah. up? Where? Menorah. The menorah was made out of beaten out of gold. It is not separate pieces that are then attached to the menorah. It is beaten in one piece of gold. I mean, you're talking about a you're talking about a nice piece of craftsmanship here, right? Where you have to take this menorah with all its fancy doodles and out of one piece of one chunk of gold that you start with, you produce a menorah. You're not taking different components and attaching them. And there's one other place we find Miksha. Mishkan. The Mishkan is not Miksha. Mishkan was made out of different, what do you call it? You're close though. The Aron Kodesh. The Aron Kodesh. And the cover of the Aron Kodesh, the cover of the Aron Kodesh had the two Kruvim jutting out of them. Right, the carobs, what are they called? Not carobs, cherub, uh, carobs are, 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 are fruit, right? Uh, the cheruvim, the, the, the two uh, images that are on top of the orange. You know, I'm talking about the cheruvim that were stacking up now. They also were not made independently and then attached to the top of the cover of the orange. They are actually taking a big piece of gold, and then you're beating out of this piece of gold, you're making it a flat cover, plus you're making it with these two cheruvim that are on top of it. So you have three examples in the Torah Thank you, Ron. You have three examples in the Torah where the word miksha shows up. Now, the first time is right over, the, the third time, actually, is over here by these trumpets. If you look back, just to, just to make sure you see that what, what I'm talking about, if you look in Parshas Truma on page, uh, turn back to page, because um, we've got a picture of it. There you go, page 447. So you see the Aron Kodesh. You see that the, the Kruvim are on top of the Aron Kodesh over there. It's, uh, they, they've had better pictures in the art scroll. But the, these, are, uh, these are the old art scrolls? Okay. Yeah. So it's on 447. You see that they, those two Kruvim, the, uh, the, the, the Sherubim, are actually attached. Uh, her, I guess the word would be, uh, I don't even know what the word is. But they're not made independently. Right? They're, put on the, they're put on the Aron Kodesh. Okay? So keep that in mind that we find it in two other places. Here, the Torah says that Moshe Rabbeinu has these trumpets, and he makes these trumpets, and based on the pattern of how he blows the trumpets, that will determine who's supposed to gather to him. One type of signal means the people are going to travel. There's another type of signal where he calls all the people. There's another type of signal where he calls only the elders. Different sounds that are made with the trumpets. Rashi, right here, says... And if you look at Rashi in the right column, in the right column, first Rashi says, says Rashi, they should blow these sounds in front of you like a king. Like the king should. And then in the next line, the second Rashi says, it's made from your own material. And then Rashi says, you make them, and you make use of them. That means you, Moshe Rabbeinu, are going to use these trumpets. And after Moshe Rabbeinu dies, these trumpets have to go into the Geniza. Trumpets, nobody else is allowed. The next leader does not use these trumpets. And only Moshe Rabbeinu uses these trumpets. So one of the ideas here is, one of the ideas here is why would these trumpets not allowed to be used by anybody else? So, you know, we're going to get to the end of the Parsha where there's this episode of the Lashon Hara, where Miriam speaks Lashon Hara about Moshe Rabbeinu. And her Lashon Hara is a very, very 
uh, a, a very, very subtle. It's only that she said, well, why is he any different than we are? He's a prophet, we're prophets. And he separated from his spouse because he's a prophet. We didn't have to, where were you? Aaron and Miriam, we're also prophets. We didn't, we live reg normally with our spouses without having to separate, without being worried about becoming impure. Whereas Moshe Rabbeinu did. And that's why she's taken the task. Because she's told by HaKosh Baruch he's different. Moshe Rabbeinu is different than everybody else. You're right, you're a prophet and he's a prophet. But Moshe Rabbeinu is different than everybody else. Uh, Lahavdil, I just remember Frank Layden, who was a college coach, he once said, where else uh, but the NBA, can you see the top basketball world players in the world all gathered together under one roof and Michael Jordan above it? And he said, you know, they're all, they're all good. But, you know, there, there's a, you know, the argument starts only after when Michael was playing. Goes, who's the best player? It starts after Michael. That was, that was a given, right? LeBron notwithstanding. And that was a given. And I mean, by the way, in Chicago, we, uh, you know, we, 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 we were never liked LeBron because, you know, there he was with a number 23. And how dare you? Right, type of thing. But he has achieved something that Michael Jordan did not achieve six times. Mike Rubin achieved something that Michael Jordan never achieved. Six times he lost in the finals. Da, 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 da. <laughs> that felt good. So the, 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 what do you call it? Moshe Rabbeinu is told, of course, Rocco says, he's different. You're all good, but he's different. Moshe Rabbeinu, first of all, the trumpets is to indicate Moshe Rabbeinu uses them, nobody else uses them. He's different. He's in a different category. He uses them, nobody else uses them. That's idea number one. Idea number two, as I heard from the Rosh Hashiva of Mendel Weinbach itself, he said, the trumpets is a way of communicating with the people. In every generation, every leader has a different way and a different method of communicating. The message to the generation is a different message, and the communication is a different form of communication. And the classic example is in the tshuva, what they call the tshuva movement. Uh, when people were searching in the 70s and 80s, so the message to the people had to do with a certain amount of, certain amount of uh, 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 meaning and a certain amount, a certain, this is the right here, a certain amount of meaning and a certain amount of intelligence. Is there an extra chumash over here? If anybody has a chumash, you can bring it for David. Yonah, are there any more chumash? I have, I have. You, have, you have a chumash, okay. So, so the, the, the message was different when they began searching in the hippie generation. The hippie generation, which was in the late, late 60s, 70s, when people were searching, say you, you presented them with something, intellectual stimulation, and a certain amount of philosophy that they were searching, a certain amount of meaning. As the generations have changed, nowadays people aren't looking for meaning, they're looking for sanity. You're in a world that's insane, and now people are just looking for sanity and decency. At a certain point, it was, you know, to, to teach me some truth. Nowadays people are, the, the, world, is so, the world is so indecent, that if you show somebody, hey, you know, there's a system of decency. It's a completely different message. It's a completely different what means of communication. So the first lesson here is that each leader in his generation has to know what it is, what it is that his, what's, what's the issue in our generation today? What are we, what are we concerned with today? Uh, uh, 20 years ago, the concern was people, uh, uh, drug abuse. Uh, today, the concern is technological abuse. It's a completely different, completely different message, completely different issue. Nowadays, if you find out, you know, uh, people used to waste time, uh, why, you know, you know, the old days was, was, was with dealing with television and wasting time in front of the TV. I don't know, does anybody watch TV anymore? Does anybody even bother with the television? Why would you bother with TV? You get anything you want, much more, what, what you want. You got much more different issues. You got issues with phone stuff now. You got issues with, with what do you call it? With, uh, what's it called, all the, 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 the social media. And I, by the way, I don't even have, a, I don't have a, a, a regular cell phone. I've never owned a regular cell phone. Not a regular flip phone, phone cell phone, dumb phone, whatever it is that it's called. I've never had one. I've never owned one. I never, never had, can you believe it? Yeah, people look at me like, are you serious? Yeah, yeah, people have said to me, oh, what do you do? Yeah, what do I do? What do I do about what? Well, what if people are trying to get a hold of you? Well, that's the goal, is that they can't, right? <laughs> so, and if they try to get a hold of me, they leave them, they call up my house and leave a message. And if it's a good message, meaning they're good, well, they want to give me money, I call back. If it's a bad message, they want my money, I don't call back. Yeah. So if people were looking for me all day long saying, Kaplan, we want to give you money, then I would consider getting a phone, right? But that's generally not why people are not doing it. And, and you know, for five minutes, I, I, I could think. I've seen people. I, I, I see what goes on. It, it, the, the message of it's a different message of the generation. In our generation, the message is, hey, take five minutes for yourself. 
That's the message of our judge. You are entitled to five minutes for yourself to think, to not be on call and not be on duty. That, that's, that's the rule. That's the rule. The last time my wife was expecting was about 17 years ago. So then when she went into her ninth month, she said to me, okay, this time I want you to get a phone, get a, a cell phone. I said, why? She said, well, in case I go into labor and you're not around. So I said to her, look, if I get a phone, one of two things is going to happen. It's either going to ring in shul and disturb the entire minion, or I'm going to lose it. Those are the two choices. So I have a better idea. Don't go into labor when I'm not around. <laughs> right? right? And she cooperated. She went into labor on Rosh Hashanah when I was around. <laughs> they, always, they always get the last word. So, so you, you, you know, that, that's the message of the generation. You really have to be dominated by your technology. I mean, how many people are not? Everybody today is dominated by technology. That's the message. In the old days, the message was drugs. The generation before, they had a little bit of philosophy. It changes. Each leader has to know what it is that his, 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 his generation, and therefore nobody else uses Moshe Rabbeinu's trumpet. Symbolically, he calls out his way, and somebody else calls out. There are other times where, you know, when I was raised, I always <coughs> tell people, I always tell people, you know, nowadays when you're raising children, you need a lot of psychology. A lot of psychology books written on how to psychology with children, right? The psychology, how you deal with children. I always tell people, in my generation, my father, all of us, Shalom, I was reminiscing with a friend of mine, our fathers were not psychologists. Our fathers were physical therapists, right? That, that, that's, how we, that's how it was raised in our generation. A couple of good, it tagged you a couple of good times, you know, once it, 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 it straightened things out. It wasn't, there was no kitzeling around. And if it wasn't, by the way, I, I, mean, I got spanked maybe two or three times my entire life. I deserved it, and I deserved it more, right? But the times that I got it, I got it for good reason, and I got it good in for good reason. But my parents, there was no kids league. Right? Well, the psychology, the psychology. You needed to be put in your place, they put you in your place. And because you knew, you respected your parents, you knew that your parents were putting you in your place because you deserved it. And I knew when my father put me in my place, I knew I deserved it. I knew I deserved it. I was a kid, now it's a psychology, and you got to talk like this and talk like that. Why? Because there are concerns in our generation. There are concerns. Whether it's physical abuse or verbal abuse or this abuse, that abuse. So that's the message. It's got to be a different message. Each generation a different message. Number one. Number two. Let's go to those three items. You have over here the item symbolizing leadership, and it's got to be miksha. And I told you the word miksha, the root of the word is kasha, which is hard. That means two things. A leader, number one, sometimes it's got to be tough. Sometimes it's not pleasant to be a leader. Sometimes as a leader, you've got to put people in your place. You've got to call people out. If you're going to be the rabbi of a shul, sometimes you've got to take a tough stand with people. Sometimes you can't compromise. On the one hand, on the other hand, the thing itself is difficult. It's challenging. It's a tremendous responsibility. To be a leader is a tremendous responsibility. You want to be a, you want to be a pulpit rabbi? Boy, you're go it's a tough job. It's a tough job to be the leader of the generation, to be the guide for the, to be the Moshe Rabbeinu, where you've got to take everybody's, you've got to hear everybody's fetching and complaining, and you've got to deal nicely with people, to be a communal rabbi where everybody's got something to say to you. And you got to treat people with honor and respect and a tremendous amount of patience. And they, you haven't got a minute to yourself. It's a tremendously difficult job. That's miksha. It's got to be a reminder to any leader. When you take on a position of leadership, it's a, it, it, it's a challenge. Number one. The second item that we find it by is the menorah. What did the menorah symbolize? What did we say yesterday? The light of the menorah symbolizes Torah. A person who wants to devote himself to studying Torah. Everybody's heard of Rav Chaim Kinevsky and that he was the, the leader of the generation. You know, as a, both the leader and Torah, you know, kind of, you know, kind of, he didn't have a minute to himself. You know, kind of lines there were, people coming in and asking him questions and coming for brachas. He didn't have a minute to himself. It's a, it's a tremendous responsibility, but he, where, how did he get there? He got there through Torah. You know, kind of devotion to studying Torah it was. I once saw, imagine the following. I will give you one hour. I have a machine. I once saw this on a game show. That's where I got the idea. I got the idea from a game show. There's a little box. Now, this machine, you get to pull out dollar bills out of this machine. You pull out dollar bills. I'll give you one hour to pull out as many dollar bills out of this machine, and you get to keep them. So you get one hour with this machine, with this box. Okay? Now, starting from now. Right? What do you think your hands would look like pulling dollars out of it? That's right. Right? You pull dollars out, right? What if your cell phone rang? 
What if your phone rang in the middle? No. Right? No. No. Uh, I bet it could be important. It, you answer it all other times. You answer it in shul. I see people in shul with their phone. Mm, 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 uh, uh, I thought right, it's important or it's not important. Right? So you're, you're pulling out. Okay. Now, what if I told you that it starts at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning? You get your one hour starting at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. What time do you think you can be up tomorrow morning? Four. Huh? About four, right? I don't think so. I don't think you'd go to sleep. I don't think you'd take the chance. You'll stay up all night. And then you're going to be pulling, pull, 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 okay? Now, what if it's 24 hours, not one hour? You got 24 hours to pull out a dollar bill. Okay, you're pulling, you're pulling, pull, 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 pull. Amazing how, how, how fast my hands could move for how long. And if the hand gets tired, then it would look like this, right? Just rest that one. And then, the, then, then rest that one, and then, then go back to the routine, right? And you'd be pulled for 24 hours. Okay? What happens at lunchtime? What would lunch look like? Okay, lunch break. You know, we're off. Let's go. Where are we going today? First, we have a 15-minute debate. Where are we going to? <laughs> no. It would be like this. You'd be pulling. Could somebody bring me food? What do you want? Food! We catch up. Food! Just get me the food, right? And then they bring you the food, and then put, just put, what bracha? What is it? I don't know. Just make a bori priya food. <laughs> just put it in my mouth. I don't care. I really don't care right now. Just feed me. Just give me strength. That's what it would look like. If you view every word of Torah as a mitzvah, and you view your lifetime as the limited hour, so then the urgency that you have learning Torah is the exact same urgency. So a person who learns Torah and actually gets to that level, that's the urgency that he has. That's how he becomes a Rebbe Chaim Kinevsky. So somebody asked him once, because he, he, he was learning for one hour. At one point, he was sleeping for about an hour, an hour and a half at night. So his grandson said, how do you, how do you have the energy to do this? He says, listen, I'm, people are taking up a lot of time. I haven't finished my daily quota. I have to finish my daily I have no choice. I have no choice. I have no choice. When you have a child who's crying, and you have a baby crying in the middle of the night, and the baby, you need to be up, you're going to be on sleep deprivation. Yeah, but I need to sleep. Yeah, but the baby needs you to hold him. Baby's got colic. Baby's colicky. You got, well, baby gets colicky. A newborn baby gets colicky a little bit. That means the stomach muscles, the stomach digestion is not, is not fully developed yet. The baby has cramps, could be crying 22 out of 24 hours. And when the baby's not crying, you're crying. Right? That's the way it is. I have no choice. I have to do it. Yeah, yeah, Jake, that's what you got to look forward to. Yeah, yeah. And then and then what do you call it? The baby's crying. Okay, the baby's crying. You got no choice. If Torah is that urgent, that's miksha. The, aura, the menorah, the flame of the menorah, represents the devotion that's needed for Torah. It's miksha, it's difficult, it's challenging. Torah is not easy. <coughs> Torah is not easy. Torah, Torah is challenging. And therefore, that's the second item. What's the third item that's miksha? Is those kruvim that are made on the Aron Kodesh. What do the kruvim represent? The kruvim has the face, Rashi says they have the face of the innocent child. Turn back for a second to Parshish Truma. We're going to take, take a look at two different places. Keep the finger on the place here. Turn back again to 447. I want to show you something. It's Pasuk um, 448. 448. Vasisa Shnei Kruvim Zahov. Second line from the top. Vasisa Shnei Kruvim Zahov. Take a look at Rashi. It's the right column, fourth line from the top. If you find it, please show the person next to you. Rashi says the word kruvim. Everybody see that? Fourth line from the top. Kruvim, says Rashi. What do they look? Demus partsuf tinok lahem. They have the image, the facial image of a child. 448. 448. Okay, 448, right column of Rashi. And Rashi says the word kruvim. And Rashi says... Demus parts of Tinoklahem. They have the facial image of a child. When you think of a child's face, you think of, you know, the pure, there's a certain purity of the child's face. That's what the Kruvim are. Does anybody else know where the Kruvim are found? The word Kruvim is found in the Torah? Where else does the Torah say the word Kruvim? Anybody know? Take a look all the way, keep your finger on the good. Go all the way to Parshas Voracious. Page 18. Correct. Page 18, six lines from the bottom. Six lines from the bottom. This is when Adam Harishon, Adam is punished because God finally tells him what's going to happen. And then six lines from the bottom, it says, Vayishal Cheyu Hashem Elokim Gan Eden. God expels him from Gan Eden. 
to work the earth. He chases him out. And at the east end of Eden, he puts up the Kruvim. The flaming sword. To protect that there's no access to the tree of life. And Rashi says, what are they called? They're called Kruvim. What are these Kruvim that God puts up in Gan Eden? You take a look at... Rashi is where? Um, where's the Rashi here? Hmm? Correct. Left side of Rashi, left column of Rashi, middle line. Says Rashi, if everybody finds it, please show the person next to you. It says, Es HaKruvim, what is it, where are these Kruvim? Malachi Chavola, destructive angels. Destructive angels, that's what these Kruvim are. Well, make up your mind. Over here by the Aaron Kodesh, Rashi said the Kruvim have the Demus parts of Tinak. They got the pure face of a child. So make up your mind. Are these Kruvim, are these Kruvim destructive angels or are these Kruvim have the pure face of a child? And the answer is, well, it depends where the Kruvim are. When you put up the Kruvim out in the garden, out in the field, like on Aden, with no boundaries and no restrictions, so what are these children going to end up like? They're going to end up destructive angels. If you put them on the Oron Kodesh, on the Holy Ark, where the Torah is, meaning you're raising children on Torah values, so then what are your children going to look like? They're going to have, the face, they're going to have that pure face of children. In other words, if it depends. When it comes to chinuch, when it comes to raising children, raising children is miksha. It's difficult. Biggest challenge of your life. Not the second biggest challenge. Second biggest challenge. A guy once came to Roy Feldman. He said he was having trouble in his marriage. He said it's the most difficult relationship. He said, no, he was having trouble with a child. So he was having trouble with one of his kids. Could you believe it? A father's having trouble with a teenage son. Can you believe it? So he came to me and said, I'm having trouble. He said, the most difficult relationship. He said, no, no, it's a difficult relationship. It's still not the most, the most difficult relationship is still an always marriage. Marriage is always the most challenging relationship. In a good marriage. In a good marriage. It's the most challenging relationship. The, the reason is because with children, teenagers, for a certain, no matter how difficult children are, teenagers are, no matter how difficult, for a certain amount of hours they're going to be out of, out, out of sight and out of mind. Either they'll be in school, they'll be at work, or they'll be in jail. One way or another. But for a few hours a day, he'll be you know, meeting with his parole officer. Well, for a few hours a day, he's out of your head. Your spouse can never be out of your head. Your spouse can never be out of your head. Because even if you don't, obviously when you go to work, you have to do your job properly. And when you're learning a Torah, you have to learn Torah properly. But you can't make any independent decisions with a spouse. A husband could come home. I'll just give you one example. This is a classic example. When it happens to you, when it ha- not if it happens to you, when it happens to you, just remember this smiling mug. <laughs> right? And you can make the checks out the Kaplan with a K. Right? And just write, yes, you told me so. Right? So a guy, the husband's on the way home. The husband comes home. The wife serves a, a, a meal. And the husband eats. And the wife says, you didn't like the chicken? Says, no, no, it's really good. How come you only had one piece? Well, you know, this is the guy who normally goes, for sure, two, sometimes three, and when he's in high gear, four. Yeah. And all of a sudden, he only had one piece of chicken. Well, I said, well, you didn't like the chicken? No, it was really good. So I only had one piece. Well, on the way home, I had a Danish. You had a Danish? He didn't tell me. No. Right? Like, this is like, 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 you need a Shabak over here. You know, this is the Mossad. You know, I have to report Danish, Danish activity. You know, like, like, what happened? What went wrong? You know what went wrong? Nothing wrong with getting a Danish. But your wife made supper for you. And... Eating the Danish is going to stop you. So at a minimum, call her up and say, by the way, I'm going to have to put away to supper for later. Or let her know in advance that you're not going to be, so she can put away. The, you're, you're, you're making independent decisions. And you can't do it. You're married, you can't. I'm talking about in a good marriage. You cannot make independent decisions, even little decisions. And, it's, she, and the way a wife feels often is, like, what, what you're sneaking. They always suspect us, by the way. Women always are suspicious that we're doing something sneaky, devious, and underhanded, which is true. I can't, <laughs> I can't say that it's not true. But they are, they are always, always very, very suspicious of us, which is why we, which is which, for good reason. But here, it was inconsiderate of you. She goes, she works, she makes a meal for you, takes her time to make a meal, and you just go well, without any forethought. You eat it, which means that, that some of her work is for nothing. So what you do it for? You understand how? And all it was was a Danish, my goodness. It was just a Danish. That's all it was. 
you can't make independent decisions. You can't make your, your, so that's a tricky relationship. With your children, it's a completely different relationship because when he's out of your head, it's like you're not thinking about him until you see him in the house, until you see him sitting around doing absolutely nothing or doing something which is illegal, whatever it is. But until, while he's out of, he's out of your mind. I don't have to, I could eat a Danish. My, my teenage son doesn't care if I eat a Danish. Couldn't care less. He doesn't know if I eat, when I eat, he doesn't care as long as he eats, right? So he does, he's not thinking about it. Your wife is a different relationship. When it comes to your child, it comes to your child, how are you going to raise that kid? You know, in Israeli schools, secular state schools, they did a, stu they did a study at a secular state school, 33% of the kids in the secular Israeli state schools, the non-religious schools, 33% of the kids carry plastic box cutters as a weapon. And 50% of those kids said they carry them in self-defense. So much so that they've, 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 they've thought about, they haven't done it yet, thought about having like, you know, like in American schools where you got to walk through a, a metal detector to go into the school. In the from schools, so they have trouble also. Some of the kids bench too fast. Right? That's, that, that's, considered, that's considered, ooh, you know, slow down over there. Right? There are no plastic box cutters in from schools. Right? Those are the faces of the angelic children. I don't say they're, I, listen. They're not, they're not Sadiqim just yet. You know, I could tell you stories. But <coughs> you're raising them on Torah values, and it's miksha. Chinuch, raising your children is one of the biggest challenges you will ever have in your life. Because it's, there, it, it's challenging. And that's why the Torah, by the Kruvim, the Torah uses the word miksha to remind you. These three things, when it comes to leadership, it comes to Torah study, and it comes to chinuch, they are all miksha. They all are challenges in life. If you succeed... And you will, Bezer Hashem. That's the most satisfying areas of success. But just realize, none of it, none of it is a cakewalk. It's all very, very challenging. Somebody had a question. Yeah, good one. Why do the other 50% carry box cutters? The other 50% are the ones who attack them. Yeah. 50% <laughs> are self-defense, 50% are free to attack. Or they attack the teachers. There's a severe shortage of teachers in the Israeli school systems today because the teachers are, 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 are frustrated. They have no control over the kids. They cannot, what do you call it? They cannot, they cannot uh, uh, you can't do any disciplining in the schools. Uh, their teachers have been assaulted in the schools by the parents who are upset with this, that, and the other. And there's a shortage. They, they, they have a crisis in the country right now, among other crises. They have this crisis with the teachers. If you don't raise a child on Torah values, that's what's going to happen. And again, even if you raise them on Torah values, they still need to have a tremendous amount of tefillah that goes, you got to dive in for success, you have to have siyata dishmaya. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Raising children is a challenge. And the children see all your flaws as a parent. The children, you can't fake the kids out. The kids see exactly what you are. The kids, it's a challenge. And the best, the most successful way to raise, raise children is working people. I say, well, give me a good book on raising children. Okay, the best book is the Masila Sisharan. Right? Work on yourself. That's the best way to raise children. Right? The more you work on children are imitated. The more you, you, you work on your own character, the children, children see right through you. Children see right through the parents. Okay. Take a look at uh, uh, um, Perak Yudal of Pasuches. So here we get to, back, back to the ranch, 11.28. 11.8, sorry, 11.8. Page. Uh, 788. No, that's not right. That's not right. Oh, here it is. Yeah, yeah, it is right. Okay. So here we're talking about the, uh, uh, um, the, the mana that's coming down. The mana, which is one of the more intriguing uh, ideas that the Jewish people went through the desert for 40 years and they ate mana from heaven. So it says, Vahaman Kizra, it's right in the middle of 780. Vahaman Kizra Gadhu, Veeno Kein Habedolach. How does the arts girl translates it? Uh, this would be good. The man, the people, uh, what, what's it called? Now, the mana was like coriander, coriander seed, and its color was like the color of bedolach. Notice that it's only transliterated because we don't know what color that was. Kein Habedolach. So, hi. So we're talking about the manna that comes down from heaven. Now, what do we know about the man? We know that the man fell for different people in different proximity to their homes. For tzaddikim, it fell closer to the homes. And for the people who are less righteous, it fell a little further. They had to do a little more work. And for the less righteous, it fell further away, number one. Number two, what's the most famous idea you know about the man? It could taste like anything, right? Even biltan. 
right? There you go. Kamun could taste like biltan, and you could, uh, you could make it taste like anything that you want to taste like. You think, okay, that's what the Midrashim say. And it's not like the Jewish was like, man, I, and, and we're picturing just a bunch of people saying, okay, let's see, uh, uh, um, corned beef. Mm. <laughs> and, and that's all they did with the man all day. I don't know exactly what it means. I don't know exactly what it means. But the commentaries, obviously, if that's what it says, there's a lesson in it for us. In other words, the goal wasn't here to maximize pleasure. The goal wasn't, we're talking about a very spiritual generation. We're talking about a generation who received the Torah at Sinai and spent the time in the desert. What, what does that mean it could taste like anything? So there's a, a, a famous idea, I'm sure that you, you've heard it, in whose merit was the water there? Whose merit? The well was there in whose merit? Bear of Miriam, right? That's what I called the well of Miriam. And when Miriam died, the well came back in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. But when, be, 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 while it was there, it was considered a Be'ira Shel Miriam. And whose merit were the clouds there? The clouds of glory. In Aaron's merit, right? The clouds that surrounded the Jewish people were there in the merit of Aaron Akoyin. And the manna fell in the merit of whom? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu was the one in, in you know, arguably the, the manna, that comes down, that sustains them for 40 years, that was in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, when we think of Moshe Rabbeinu, what we think of and we associate with Moshe Rabbeinu more than anything else is obviously the Torah. So the commentaries point out that the manna being, having all the various tastes and all the various flavors or whatever it is that we're imagining at our, at our deep spiritual level, whatever it is that we're imagining, what's the connection between the manna falling in the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu who brought down the Torah. Mm -hmm. How do you make it? What's the connection there? What's one thing got to do with the other? The answer is that there were seven branches of that menorah. The menorah that represents Torah also had seven branches. Those seven branches represent the seven branches of wisdom in the world. And that we understand all wisdom is contained in Torah. The same way that the man could taste like anything you want, all wisdom is contained in Torah. The Chazonish is well known. He knew medicine. The Vilna Gon was a master of astronomy, astrology. Every wisdom, every branch of wisdom, if you know how to find it in the Torah, based on the various secrets or Kabbalistic secrets, whatever it is, you could find every branch of wisdom in the Torah. Do you know that the Vilna Gon wrote a book on trigonometry? Are you aware of that? He wrote a book on trigonometry called Ayel HaMeshulosh. It's called in, uh, in uh, what do you call it, in, um, in, uh, in the math world, it's called Kramer's Theorem, right? The Villanagone's last name was Kramer. They still have it. It's called Kramer's Theorem. The Villanagone, right? Where did Villanagone hide? He knew music. He knew all the, whatever wisdom there is to know music. How did he know that? He knew it all through Torah. That means if a person knows how to study Torah properly, if you know how to study Torah properly, we, we also try to study it at our level. Then there's something called Chochmas Apartsuf. You can read faces. You know, people have faces, the facial features of a person. There's nothing to do with how handsome we are. It's the facial feature of a person. There's a wisdom of reading faces, reading arms, reading hands. What you read in the newspaper is nonsense, by the way. You know, people who claim they're palm readers, right? they, they're palm readers, yeah, they take the money right out of your palm. That, we're not talking about that. We're talking about there's, a gen, there is an actual, you know, there's an actual wisdom of, re, of astrology. Right? What do you call it in the newspaper? Don't they have your horoscope? In the newspaper, yeah. Well, the horoscope in the newspaper, I hope you realize, is nonsense. I hope you realize, you read the horoscope; it's always the same thing. You open it, and it says you're going to meet someone very special today, right? And then you get mugged. You know that guy's pretty. <laughs> you know <laughs> that guy was pretty special. You know, or he was holding a Saturday night special, whatever it was. You know, he, you know, or you're going to have a special day today. When your mother-in-law comes for an extended visit, you know that's pretty special. All these things, you know, that, that's all nonsense. But according to the Torah, do you know that there is a? I had a. I, there's a photocopied picture of a case that happened in Israel. There was a man who needed brain surgery. This is documented, and I had actually a copy of this. I once had, I don't know where I put it, I put it in one of my desk drawers. There was a man who needed brain surgery, and the doctors could not, did not know how to uh, 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 access the part of the brain that they wanted to do the surgery with, and the chazonish, the chazonish, who was the, 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 the leader of the generation, he drew a picture for the doctors. He drew a picture, and the picture, I showed it to Rabbi Tatz once. Rabbi Tatz is a doctor, also a medical doctor. I showed it to Rabbi, he, I didn't show it to him. I asked him if he'd seen it. He said he's seen it. 
He's seen the, the diagram that the Chalzanish drew, because they have a copy of the diagram. He said he didn't understand what was so profound about it, but somehow the doctors at the time did not know the Chalzanish drew it. Based on that, based on that diagram, the Chalzanish, they, they did the surgery. It's a successful surgery. Now, where did the Chalzanish, he didn't go to medical school. Chalzanish was studying Torah from the time he was 13 years old. So where did Chazanish know? Nobody knows how did Chazanish know it. The answer is that all wisdoms are in Torah. That's a connection between the man and the Torah. The money has all flavors, symbolically, that the Torah carries all branches of wisdom in it. Okay. Take a look. Take a look at, uh, uh, towards the end of the Parsha now. Parakid Beis Pasuk Aleph. So here you have the episode of Miriam, page 794. And it starts right, it starts on the eighth line. Vatidaber Miriam ve Aaron be Moshe. Miriam and Aaron spoke about Moshe. 794, eighth line. Al Oda se Isha Hakushis Asher Lokach. Regarding the Isha Hakushis. Ki Isha Hushis Lokach. For he had married a Hushis woman. Now, Rashi says Kushis means that she was very, very beautiful. And then when Moshe Rabbeinu came down from Harsina, he separated from her. Moshe Rabbeinu separated from his wife. Because he felt that since at any time he can be communicated with by God, he's got to be in a state of purity. And if a man cohibits with his wife, so at that point he's tame. So Moshe Rabbeinu felt that he has to separate from his wife, and HaKadosh Baruch ratified his decision. That's what, the, that's what the Gemara says, and that's what Miriam said to Aaron. Vayomru, harakach b'Moshe diber Hashem? Did God only speak to Moshe? Halo gambonu diber v'yishma Hashem. My God has spoken to us as well. And Hashem has heard what they said. In other words, we're also prophets. Miriam was a prophet, Aaron was a prophet, yet we live regularly with our spouses. We did not separate from our spouses. And so why is Moshe Rabbeinu, why did he have to separate from his spouse? And then the Torah says, Ve'ish Moshe, anav me'od. Moshe was very humble. Mikol ha'odam adam than any man on the face of the earth. Does anybody see the irony of this statement? First of all, the Torah is saying it to let us know that Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't bothered by what people said about it. He's humble. He didn't, he didn't have any, even if he, if he knew what people said, he wasn't, he, he, he wasn't bothered by it. The irony of the statement before anything else, who wrote it? Moshe. Moshe wrote this, wrote this <laughs> sentence. Hmm? Yeah, can you picture that? Moshe, Moshe's writing. He's writing the Torah. He has communicated God. No one was as ever as humble as me. Is it to strike you as ironic? Moshe Rabbeinu wrote, no one has ever been as humble as me. The guy walks around, I am so humble. I am so humble. The end of right? What's that? The end of Zara. The end of Sota. Where Rabbi Yosef says that when the Gemara says that there was no, when Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi died, humility died with him. And Rabbi Yosef says, don't say the Rabbi Yosef that we're learning about in the Gemara right now. Rabbi Yosef says, don't say that humility died, I'm still around. Hmm. That's what the Gemara says. Hmm. Isn't that ironic? Okay. So well, there is a tongue-in-cheek state. One of the commentaries says that Rav Yosef was actually saying that to hide his humility. He wanted to make himself look haughty so that people wouldn't even know how humble he is. <laughs> right? That it was, he was doing it. As a, the best defense is a good offense. But there, there, there's a much, much, much more important here. The, the, the Torah, first of all, before anything else, the Torah is communicating, what is humility? What is humility? Humility is not denial. That's a mistake that people make. A guy hits a home run and 50,000 sophisticated people are standing on their feet screaming his name. And the guy, now how's he going to remain humble at that moment? What's he going to do? supposed to look up and say, no, I didn't do it. That's, not, that's stupidity. That's not humility. If you painted that painting over, I'd say, wow, that's a gorgeous painting. you got tremendous artistic doubt. What do you say? No, 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 no. Saying no is not humility. Right? You did it. You obviously have more talent than I do. If I, if I would paint it so it would look like what they call, uh, uh, what's it called now? Modern art. You know, just basically somebody splattered some paint on the canvas. Modern art. Oh, beautiful. Oh, sorry. Oh, here we go. Right? Modern art. Right? So, so wait, wait, humility is not denial. Humility means I recognize my abilities. And you have reckon, a responsibility to recognize your abilities. There isn't a person in this room who's got, got abilities, capabilities, and various talents. And you have to know what your talents are. You have to know what you're capable of. But you also have to realize that whatever you have is only a gift. It's only something that was given to you. And so if you've been given it, A, you have an obligation to use it within certain par uh, parameters, the best, assuming you know, it needs a certain amount of guidance. But you also have to know exactly who you are. 
You have to know who you are. If guys got they just reported a girl. There's a girl now who's 10 years old. A Mexican girl is 10 years old. She's registering the highest IQ in history. Einstein and Stephen Hawking were 160. This girl is registering 162. And she, she, she graduated school, uh, grammar school at five years old, high school at eight years old. Now she's 10 years old and she's studying something like, like quantum somethings or others. Right, <laughs> I know that I saw the word engineering in the in, in and sort of the word engineering is in the in the report and the word quantum in the report. Neither of which I know what they are. Right, so so she's got an IQ. She's outscored me by about a hundred points. Right, she's at a hundred. She's at hundred and sixty-two. But she doesn't know what she is. She doesn't know what she. She doesn't know where she. She, she, she doesn't know that she's she's a taking college courses, high-level college courses. She doesn't know. Of course, you know. You have to know what you are. You have to know your abilities. That's not humility. Humility is the recognition that the fact that I've given a certain talent or certain ability or certain capability, but it's got nothing to do with me if that's what a coach Baruch Hu gave you. So he gave, he gave you artistic talent. So he gave you the talent. Now use the talent, but don't, do, don't let it go to your head, that's all. Don't let it go to your head. And I'm no better than anybody else. The fact that I, my IQ is 162 doesn't make me better than anybody else. Oh, well, I can look down at you because your IQ is only on 20 and mine is 162, therefore I'm better than you. I'm not better than you. I happen it could have been the other way around. It could have been the other way around. You could have had the 162, I could have. So you know, I haven't done anything. Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't feel he's done anything. So what? It's like, Coach who gave me this role, I haven't done anything. He's genuinely humble because he understands that it's nothing to do with me. I was giving, but you think Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbeinu didn't know that his face was glowing? Moshe Rabbeinu didn't know his face. He didn't know he was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights without eating. He didn't know that he was the leader of the Jewish people. Okay, he knew all of that. So what? So that was God chose me for this role. So that's my role. So what's, so what, what's the big deal? It doesn't make me any better than anybody else because he could have created me the same way. So, so when Moshe Rabbeinu, listen, I'm from Chicago. It's never gone to my head. You know, this, yeah. what can I tell you? You know, that everybody else wishes they were, but I was. You know, what can I do? I was chosen. Okay, I was from Chicago. I know, I know, everybody's jealous. Everybody in the world is jealous. They would rather be Americans. And everybody in America wants to be a Chicago. And what can I do? Those are the facts. This was the, this are all surveys of Chicago. All they've done studies in Chicago, and that's what the studies have indicated. <laughs> so Miriam speaks about Moshe Rabbeinu. She gets upset. Moshe Rabbeinu is separated from his wife. And that, at her level, is considered Rosh Hashanah. And what's intriguing is, why does Miriam step in over here? Why does Miriam get involved? A fascinating answer. Why does Miriam get involved here? And why does Aaron get involved? And we say Miriam gets punished and Aaron doesn't. When is the last time a man separated from his wife that we find somewhere in the Torah? When's the last time a man separated from his wife? There's a man named Amram. Oh, right. And when the Egyptians made the decree to throw the children into the river, so Amram separated from his wife. And because he separated all the men, so he was the God of Hador, he was the leader. Amram separated from his wife. Because he felt, what should we have children for? They're going to throw the boys into the river. So a certain young lady said to him, you know, your decree is worse than Paro's. Because Paro's decree is only on the boys. Your decree is on boys and girls, because nobody's going to be born now. Who was the young lady who said it? Miriam, isn't that interesting? The last time somebody separated, who got involved? Miriam. And what was the result of him reuniting with his wife? Moshe was born. Moshe was born. So Miriam has already got a track record of getting involved when people have separated. And not only that, as a result of her track record, Moshe Rabbeinu was born. So of all people who should know not to separate, is Moshe. she's got every good reason in the world to get involved over here. You understand? Got every, and what's Aaron's role in Klai Israel? What did Aaron do? He was a peacemaker between husband and wife. So when Miriam says, Aaron, you know, we got an issue with Moshe Rabbeinu and his wife, Aaron's listening, well, yeah, well, do I need to get involved here? In other words, they're both following the role that they've been playing all along. And yet they're taking the task for it. Why? Because Moshe Rabbeinu is different. Moshe Rabbeinu, you should have known. If Moshe Rabbeinu is doing something, don't get involved. That means you could have all the justifications in the world. You could have all the, all the rationalization in the world, but you're still going to be taken to task because you should have known you're overstepping your bounds. And since you overstepped your bounds, at that point, Miriam's going to end up with being punished for the Lushenhar.